Hello and welcome to the National Library's signature program for conversations. My name is Mervin from the National Library's engagement team and good morning, good afternoon or good evening to whoever you're tuning in from. There is always something to discover at the library where we seek to ignite passion for learning through our collections, services and programs. Now, Four Conversations is where we bring together thought leaders to share new possibilities for the future, inspire lifelong learning, and the creation of new knowledge based on the theme, New Thinking for a New World. Yesterday, we had some really exciting conversations from our local and international speakers on the future of work and our well-being. Now, to kick off the third conversation on things in the art scene, we have Mr. Terence Chong, who will be moderating this particular session. Terence is the Deputy Director of ISEAS, Yusuf Ishak Institute in Singapore. Now, as part of today's conversation, we have specially put together a resource guide that you can refer to if you would like uh, to learn more about this topic. You can access it through the QR code and the link we'll be putting up later. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome to the NLB's Four Conversation series. This is the third conversation in the series and it's entitled Arts Transformation in the Virtual Era. I'm Terence, and I'll be the moderator for this session. So as we all know, the arts is facing great challenges in the face of COVID-19. With lockdowns and social distancing the world over, arts practitioners have struggled to make ends meet. Without live audiences or arts buyers, arts practitioners have had to find new and innovative ways to not only create art, but also to showcase it. Going dig digital has been one solution. So theatre performances are now live streamed. Art exhibitions can be enjoyed through virtual tours around galleries and museums, while webinars have provided an important platform for more conversations and discussions on art and allowed them to take place. Now, the obvious advantage of going digital is that a local performance can now reach a global audience effortlessly. But what are the disadvantages of making art in a virtual world? In his seminal essay, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction in 1935, cultural critic Walter Benjamin argued that it was the nature of capitalist society to reproduce artworks for mass consumption. Benjamin argued that this would alter the way people related to art because instead of standing in front of a masterpiece, you can stare at its poster now or its reproduction. And as a result, he argued, our ideas of art and its aura would change. The question then for us today is, the work of art in the age of virtual experience, is it worth it? Does it matter that we can only experience art through a computer screen? Today's conversation will be divided into two sections. In the first, we will talk about the challenges and opportunities that COVID-19 has posed to artists and the consumption of art. We will ask questions like, how are artists coping? How are different art sectors impacted? How have artists responded to these challenges? And in the second section, we will talk about the role of art in the time of COVID-19. We will ask questions like, has the social value of art changed? Has the meaning of art changed now we consume it differently? We will also run two polls in this section. The first that will come up very, very soon. And while the second will be up midway through the conversation. We strongly encourage you to participate. Now, I'm accompanied by two very distinguished arts practitioners and scholars. Patrick Finn is an Associate Professor of the School of Creative and Performing Arts at the University of Calgary. He's one of those few people who have successfully straddled arts and technology sectors to produce cutting-edge research. Nabila Said is an award-winning playwright. She's also a theatre critic, producer, poet, and editor of Arts Equator which is a digital platform for arts in Southeast Asia. So may I invite Patrick and Nabila to say more about themselves and the work we do, and then we can run the poll. Patrick, you first, please. Well, thank you very much, Terence. Um, and thank you to the National Library for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. Um, and particularly um, the organizers of the event uh, who have worked really hard to bring us all together at a time when it's, it's kind of challenging to book time. Uh, we're all busy in, in new ways. Um, I really have always been interested in nothing but art. I've always believed that art is the most important thing 
in the world. And so I've given my life to it. I began as a professional musician and actor, uh, then got into film and television and performance work. And my blending of art and technology really just began because when I started out in the music industry, it meant that I had to understand the technologies that were around me. And so I never saw a distinction between any form of technology, whether it's hand technology when used in gesture, um, vocal technology, or the technologies that we might now think of as game engines. And so this has been my passion my entire life. And so I continue to work as an artist in a variety of domains. I teach in the arts and I do a lot of work uh, on government boards and agencies to try and help people adjust the policies that help to support artists in the various countries of the world. Thank you, Patrick. Nabila, can I invite you to say something? Yeah, thanks, Terence. Uh, thanks so much for um, inviting me here. Uh, I don't feel like I'm one of the same scholars as the same as the rest of you, but um, I am happy to be here nonetheless to share what I know. Um, I suppose like it's quite interesting that Patrick says that like you know tech. He's so comfortable with the idea of tech, and I feel like um, I am too, um, just because of like, you know, growing up in the 90s and, you know, things like IRC or ICQ and all these things, uh, SMS um, were always part of like the growing up kind of years. Um, but often in terms of the art that I do, tech has been seen as quite separate, um, at least personally for me. Um, so this conversation is really interesting. I mean, not just this conversation, but this whole year in thinking about how the two can kind of like be married together in a way that's more um, comfortable and harmonious. And I think that that is what, um, I think that's kind of like the goal or it seems like it's supposed to be the goal, but of course the journey towards it is something that uh, I am struggling with and I think some people are also struggling with. So I'm really excited to hear from Patrick because he sounds really optimistic um, and, and hopefully that kind of like um, <clears throat> tells us what the conversation today is going to be like. Yeah. Thanks, Nabila. So as I started off, um, I noted that the arts community is really struggling uh, in the time of COVID-19. And governments all around the world have been preoccupied and challenged uh, to respond to COVID-19. And of course, um, it has impacted many different industries, the health industry, the economy, uh, the economy and so on and so forth. Um, and the arts has taken a major hit as well. I guess what we can do is, right off the bat, we can talk about what governments in Singapore and Canada uh, have been doing uh, for the arts. Um, and this will lead us nicely to the poll that uh, uh, we set up. Can you bring up the poll, please? Okay, so would, would COVID-19 uh, weaken, which statement most accurately reflects your views? Uh, Number one, the challenges of COVID-19 will weaken the arts community in the mid to long term. Number two, the challenges of COVID-19 will strengthen the arts community in the mid to long term. And the challenge of, challenges of COVID-19 will have little or no impact on the arts community in the mid to long term. I invite all our participants to answer the poll and then uh, we can discuss the findings in a while. Uh, so perhaps I can turn to Patrick. Um, what do you think... Uh, how would you answer this, this question? Oh, it's a terrific question. Um, so I would, I would suggest that it will strengthen the arts community in the mid to long term. Um, and I like the fact that you've mentioned mid to long because right now we are suffering. And so it, it, my answer, I appreciate Nabila saying that I'm an optimist. I'm an artist, so I'm always thinking of creating. But it is important to say that artists by and large are sensitive human beings. And so when the world is feeling pain, artists feel that pain a great deal. Uh, the other part of it is that our artists tend to be, depending on the countries we're in, countries have taken different approaches to supporting the arts and those capacity systems have been hit. And so with artists, it might be that people like Nabila and I who do a lot of writing, we can continue to do some of our work. But those who we might collaborate with in areas such as theater or dance or symphony music, these, these types of areas that have large capacity systems around them that have been built up over decades and are staffed by highly skilled people, 
all of these people are losing their work. And one of the aspects of art that is maybe the most exciting, but often the most frustrating, is that when art is great, it's often perceived as kind of magical. And what people that work in the arts can tell you is that the magic that you see on stage or on the screen is not magic, it's thousands of hours of work to make it look effortless. And those thousands of hours, if it happens to be me up on the stage or it happens to be uh, people in one of Nabila's plays, uh, are supported by a series of people who are behind the scenes, who are excellent at supporting the type of work that needs to be there. So in the short term, all of those people are suffering and we could see the loss of capacity in a way that would be very hard to rebuild because the skills that these people have take a lifetime to develop. And just because you don't see them on the stage or in front of the camera does not mean that their talent isn't every bit as important as the people in front of the camera. And indeed, I don't know how much you've seen of the you know, co contemporary TV makers that have been trying to keep broadcasting from their homes. It's very apparent that many of the people who are the most popular actors in the world are not particularly good when they don't have their production teams around them. Uh, so I do fear for the loss of that capacity. On the positive side, we are having the COVID experience on the backdrop of the greatest shift in knowledge construction in human history. The last time we had a shift this large was when we shifted from manuscript to print technology. That was a shift that saw the complete transformation of all aspects of social organization. The digital transformation is larger, it's broader, and it's moving more quickly. And so within the arts, we have long known, I think just like Nabila pointed out, we understand that we were all born into the digital age and we are all digital citizens and we are all digital artists. But the systems that were created to support the arts in the industrial age need to be transformed. So if there is a silver lining to this moment, it is allowing us to ask new questions about how we can be artists in the digital age. And so while it is unfortunate that we are struggling and that we cannot get together with audiences or with our colleagues and collaborators, it's inviting us all to jump into the digital space to begin exploring. Because at the end of the day, artists create and they will find a way. They will find a way to work in new ways. They will find a way to reach audiences. They will find a way to take in the experience of the world and bring forth beauty. I like the points you brought up. I think very often people forget that being an artist is just hard work. It's just thousands of hours of honing your craft um, um, through blood, sweat and tears. And, and what people see is a final product. Uh, and it can be so easily take, be taken for granted. Um, lots of food for thought. Uh, I, I want to pick a few points uh, uh, from what you said just now, but before that, can I just turn to Nabila and perhaps get your views on the poll and how, how would you answer? Yeah, I mean, I see the poll results and I'm quite glad because my answer coheres to um, the wisdom of the, the crowd in this Zoom room. Because um, I also feel like it will strengthen the arts community. And it's interesting the way this question has been set up because it's about the arts community and not the arts industry, which I think is slightly different. And, and Patrick um, kind of alluded to that. Um, because I've seen how the arts community is like really trying to rally around each other. And um, kind of like drawing back to what Patrick was saying about how some jobs are not quite um, preserved in the same way during this you know COVID period as others within the arts industry so you know like um, like the tech uh, tech side of of, of, um, of arts they don't um, the kind of shift towards digital has sl slightly less room for them I feel based on like my observations but artists who are going for let's say government grants right Terence based on uh, kind of like answering your question a little bit, there are grants which have come out during COVID, um, which are trying to um, get artists to create more work for the digital space. Um, and I, I've heard of people who are like trying to, you know, when they're putting together their proposals and their budget, trying to find ways to hire their friends who are not, um, who might not get the, the usual jobs with this switch uh, to dig digital, you know, and they're trying to find out, okay, how can I put my tech friend and, and, you know, and give them a space to kind of like maybe be the technician, even if they might not actually be usually like kind of tech savvy, um, how do you find that room for them? And I think like all these kind of maneuverings uh, on the 
almost like bureaucracy level or administrative level is a way to um, is a way for the community to actually strengthen itself, like strengthen the bonds between um, each other. Um, but I think the other part of it is the industry, which I think, um, yeah, it, that that side of it is a little bit harder to be mm. optimistic about. Yeah, and I think that's the more important part. I mean, the industry, and it goes back to what Patrick was saying. Um, if you have technicians, uh, lighting uh, experts, uh, uh, set designers, um, electricians who suddenly do not have any more work because theatres are shut, um, um, gallery spaces are closed, then how do you make the transition if you are a craftsman or a technician uh, into the virtual world? It's very easy for some disciplines, I would guess. I mean, I think Nabila would make the transition quite effortlessly. Correct me if I'm wrong. But what about um, artists and, and people who are behind the performing arts? Uh, how do they make their transition and how painful is it? Uh, to to any, of, any of you? Well, I think it's... I think it's incredibly painful. I think this is something that is that is of great importance. So when I advocate for becoming aware of digital, it's because digital is primary literacy. But what I care about as an artist is craft. I care about techne. And so the people that I know that are stage carpenters, that are uh, electricians, that are lighting experts, projection experts, costume experts, um, these people are extraordinary. And um, Yes, I can make a temporary shift into this domain, but the greatest work that I've ever done has been when I've been afforded the opportunity to collaborate with those people. So much like Nabila has observed in our community, what I'm seeing is a lot of people coming together saying, look, I'm out of work as a stage carpenter. Here are the things I can do. Because the people that are working in theaters to put on shows are not just electricians and carpenters. They're exceptionally gifted electricians and carpenters. So they can go out and do, they have real world skills. Uh, the worry for me there is, is, first of all, I have a short term worry for them, their well-being and their families. But if I'm thinking about the art, it's the loss of them to the domain. People that go into the arts are not going into it because they're driven by, I, I want to become fabulously wealthy. They have committed themselves to craft. And so if you lose those people, it will take a generation to be able to get back to the type of place where what you can do is truly realize the vision of something that Nabila would write. Yes, she can write it and put it on Zoom and it will be great. But is she really able to pursue the type of performance that she's able to pursue when she's in collaboration with these people that dance between, in a sense, the virtual world of ideas inside of the mind and the, you know, the internet world of things world where there are actual objects and spaces that we come together in. Mm. Nabila? Yeah, uh, maybe if I can uh, jump in. I was, um, I heard this kind of like uh, anecdote or someone was recounting about how, you know, during the SARS period where it was also like, you know, kind of like a epidemic that was hit, um, that hit the industry as well. Um, actually, we actually lost a lot of practitioners or we actually lost a lot of people from the arts who actually didn't come back. And, and I mean, Patrick did mention like about how like, you know, they can maybe pivot to um, being like delivery people or going into, you know, other kind of sectors which are hiring at the moment uh, and, and kind of like the gig economy. But um, the question is, um, are they going to come back? And for myself as a kind of a critic, Sometimes I do a lot. Of, sometimes I do research about oh how the arts you know industry has like uh, evolved over the years, and you like to look at you know history to see uh, where Singapore has come from. Uh, of course, it's a very short history for Singapore in terms of the arts uh, or like kind of like the modern art industry. Um, but I see a lot of names, and then you don't see them now still practicing. And sometimes you really mourn that loss because you're like wow these people were really illustrious, and for some reason or other they you know they left the industry to pursue maybe you know better economic opportunities, and you know that's their prerogative. But now it's kind of like they are doing the same thing, but they're forced to do it, right? Because of the, the pandemic and all of that. And then the question is, will they come back? And if they don't, what is the loss to the industry and to society, actually, not just the industry. I don't really care about the industry per se. Um, I really care about kind of like the well-being of um, society and, and just people in general, the loss of that, uh, that craft that Patrick said, but, you know, ideas and skills and 
the thing about Singapore is like we are all about our, our ideas and our people, right? So if you lose the people, if you lose the ideas, the loss is actually kind of like disproportionately larger than than. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I, I just feel that that loss is kind of bigger and harder to um, harder to count as well. Sure. I mean, just to play devil's advocate, um, if people do transition out of the arts industry and find jobs in other sectors, in say the plumbing or electric, uh, become electricians elsewhere and all that, would it mean that uh, arts would just have to evolve? Um, so it's painful at first, but instead of having lush and beautiful sets, very ornate uh, uh, designs, you begin to strip down to the bare minimum, go back to minimalist work. Um, and, and this very real uh, technical loss would influence the way artists and playwrights create new works. Um, and so perhaps it might trigger a different way of expressing themselves the different way of seeing the world. It's, I think, I think the answer is a bit of both, right? So mm. as I've said, when, when you are locked into, a, so in Canada, as in the United States, um, the policy around the way that one works as an artist was established by the government just after World War II, and they set out some tracks. So if you begin to show some talent in the arts, you're streamed into a certain path through education and if you were strong in technology it was an opposite path well those two paths need to be united in these times and so i view the change in art that is bringing those things back together as kind of bringing the family back together as if we were separated a long time ago but in terms of art and elaborate sets and what will happen art is not controlled by anything uh, I, like Nabila, worry not a whit about the industry. The money people will always show up and find ways to make money. Art is its own engine. And um, perhaps a way to think of this in a broader sense is if we think of the, you know, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 27 says that every human being has a right to access their culture. The culture of the world, the artists of the world, have always stood forward to represent the idea of what is over the next hill? What is the adventure of the North Star? What is it that inspires us? What makes us cry? What makes us worry? And so art won't be stopped by any of these things. What society can do is better serve itself by looking at how it wants to support art. If we lose capacity in craftspeople, new craftspeople will emerge. Um, elaborate sets will be there for shows that need elaborate sets. Minimalist shows will be done because the artist wants to do a minimalist set. So we really are talking about capacity in terms of what is good for society because I, like Nabila, believe that this kind of work is the type of thing that inspires us. And so at a time of great challenge, I would suggest that perhaps when we, we say, oh, let's worry more about the economy, who is going home tonight to tuck their child in and is going to read to them from an Excel spreadsheet? Who is going to comfort a loved one by reporting the quarterly numbers. Art is the most important aspect of all of our lives and art will take care of itself. But how we integrate art and artists into our society is an important question that I think we need to discuss in the ways we are now. Nabila? I mean, um, I mean, thanks for your question. I mean, it's a very kind of like realist type question, right? Um, I'm Singaporean, yeah. <laughs> so you're a realist. Um, I think like your question for me relates more to the industry, I feel. Because mm. when you're talking about um, the arts industry, and, and I think we have a very professionally driven industry, um, it's about like, you know, how diverse is the scene, you know? Yeah, we do have the companies which with the very elaborate sets and um, kind of like book the bigger venues, for example. And then we have this, maybe the smaller companies who use the black boxes, who prefer doing things, you know, in the community, in public spaces, for example. Uh, and when the industry was, I guess, healthy, um, you saw all these people taking up the positions within the whole arts industry, right? Um, but the moment you kind of like take away those things and then like you said, if we're all forced to do um, like poor man's theatre or minimalist theatre, I think artists are very re resilient, um, kind of like picking on what Patrick was saying, artists will still do the art. Um, you can't break an artistic spirit is what I feel. 
Um, but the industry, in terms of like how professional it is, I think will suffer um, if if those choices are taken out of uh, out of the equation. You know, um, there is a space for big esplanade shows. There's a space for very fringe shows, and um, and maybe as a critic, when when there were all these things on offer, it was very exciting because you saw that okay, you know. Um, like my mom won't watch a fringe show maybe, but maybe my mom will watch a really big scale, you know, high budget musical because she wants to, to kind of like just um, ease her mind when she's not working, for example. Um, but, but if it comes to a point where, where artists have no choice but to create work because, you know, of a loss of speciality, of a loss of spaces, of a loss of freedom, um, then I feel like the industry suffers, but like someone like my mom, for example, will be shut out of, of, of an art experience. And I think that's kind of like the sadder part of it. If students in schools are no longer um, exposed to the arts because of, um, let's say, uh, uh, a cut in budget, right? You can sense that loss, right? And I think that's the kind of loss that could happen um, if, if like, let's say less budget goes to the arts, you know, less uh, people are in the arts. Um, so it's more of like the industry thing, but of course, like there are bigger ramifications about the value of the arts to like the everyday Singaporean. Mm. I, yeah, please, Patrick. So I just, I saw a note in the chat that I just wanted to hit. Um, if uh, it's a question about whether um, moving away from the art and going and becoming a plumber um, was a bad move. I, I hope that I didn't give any impression of that. Um, the experience working where I do, uh, so if, when, if you work in the arts in general, um, if you're working full-time and successful and well-known, you're not doing well financially. And so we lose people to going to take full-time jobs as electricians and carpenters and plumbers because those are much better jobs. Um, when, we, when we have these shows running, people are willing to stay and do these jobs because they love the art so much, but it's a sacrifice. And so... Uh, I, I just want to be very clear on this. Uh, losing capacity is people that are willing to forego a certain amount of income and stability in order to commit to art because they love the art so much. But there's no point in my life when I would think that being a plumber is a bad job. I see myself as in league with plumbers, carpenters, with people that do real things, that, that actually do productive things with their hands um, and bring these two people. Um, so I see a kindred spirit there. It, the, it's the, the realm of abstraction and money moving, et cetera, that is alien to the artist and to the plumber, I happen to believe. Sure. Um, I've, I see a very interesting question as well. Um, I'll just dip into it, uh, dip into the chat box. Um, what are your views on irreversible changes in the art scene related to the pandemic? Um, can you name two or three major themes? irreversible changes. Can I, can I tap your, your brains on, on this, Patrick and Nabila? What, what do you think has gone and will never come back? So we talk about people who might transit, transition out of the arts and then work in another industry and then come back again when times get better. But to your mind, um, has anything changed and forever? Yes. So, so it's an excellent question. I don't know that I'll have three, but I'll have one that is massive. So we will never return to the industrial approach to the arts. Uh, the great challenge that has occurred uh, throughout the UK, uh, Canada, the United States, Australia, et cetera, is that all of us have been operating in systems that were created decades ago. And art has been running in those tracks and people have been feeling the, the challenges of that. That's gone because this shakeup has, has hit the capacity side, but it's also gotten people who were maybe too busy, stuck in a certain domain uh, to explore the possibility of digital. And we've just seen something very different. So I believe that audiences are tired of art that doesn't attend to what their awareness is. Uh, so we won't go back. And so for example, um, 10 years ago, maybe if you're coming through a theater program with me, you're going to spend a lot of time on Shakespeare. We don't study language as much as we used to. Our audiences now are better at evaluating visual and auditory media than they ever were before. So you might still do Shakespeare, but with fewer words and more and richer media. So we will see a complete transformation of art so that we can enter the digital age. Um, and so, you know, the digital age began in the middle of the 20th century, but we haven't arrived all the way there. So this is going to hit a correction on structural problems that we needed to address, not 
entirely out of negatives, but because people are beginning to ask new questions, artists are finding and creating new art forms. And that's aligning with, I think, the explosion of art inside of the digital realm and inside of uh, groups, for example, like Team Lab, who had their kind of major breakthroughs in Singapore, when people in Singapore realized that what this group of people were doing was an art form, when even they didn't understand it was an art form. So we will never return to the industrial model of art, uh, and that's a permanent change. And I'm grateful for that change, though I deeply regret the pain that everyone is experiencing right now. Nabila? Um, gosh. I feel like it's a question beyond me almost, cause, but I'll try to answer. Um, I feel like we can never, it's so hard to make these statements, um, but I feel like we can never not think about um, how, whether we want to use tech in terms of like, in how we can use art to improve our, how, improve how people access our art, if that makes sense. So, so previously, you know, there could be someone who's like, oh, that guy's a digital artist, or that person's a digital artist. Like, you know, I'm not one, you know, you can kind of like cre create that distinction quite clearly. Um, but now I feel like there's no excuse to, let's say, even if we do return to the theater and do make shows in the theater again, um, to have a conversation about, oh, do you think we should record it, not for archival, but record it so that we can somehow, um, you know, ex let people access this uh, this piece of show like beyond their show's runtime or the you know the program run for example or um and, and i think that's quite a big shift already because we've, we've always thought about archiving works as you know once you record it it's just going to be like in our archive and you know no one cares about it anymore so the value of the archive became really um it became really valuable during this time um i think the other thing is also to think about i I'm not sure if it's, it's irreversible, but the conversation has shifted to who, who doesn't have access to my work and how can I improve the access? And that means people like, you know, um, working mothers or, you know, busy parents who have no time to bring their children to the to theater or um, people with access needs who previously couldn't go to the theater, for example. Um, how can we use tech to, to improve that, that, uh, that situation and increase our, our, our audience, I suppose? Um, and just the idea of like how the arts audience or theatre audience can be quite middle class in Singapore. How can we start to change that? Um, I feel like these are questions that we are starting to ask during this time. And I'm hoping that we will try to find the answer, you know, beyond COVID. That's an interesting point, Nabila. I mean, so you talked about the middle class uh, arts consumer. And, and the middle class has been badly hit by, by the pandemic and the economic downturn that has followed. Uh, and that in turn uh, has reduced spending. Uh, our disposable income is down. So that impacts the demand for the arts as well. And that in turn uh, narrows the opportunities for artists to work. Uh, so this segues very nicely into a question from, from the box, is it? Um, by Ong Chi Ming. He says, I'm wondering if people are putting more value in the arts or arts or have arts become a low priority? The implication whether the general public are willing to spend on arts could impact also whether artists can continue to be resilient and try digital ways, uh, which can be an expensive endeavor for some. Um, what are your thoughts on that? So it's an, it's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. um, I think that what we want to remember is that part of the capacity that's been shaken was also the artist's ability to access money. Mm. So one of the things that can happen is Nabila can now go online and raise money a few dollars at a time to put on an elaborate show. So just because there isn't capacity in the economy for the artist doesn't mean that the arts can't continue. We can find ways to make art happen. But it's also important just because I believe that art is the most important thing, and I believe that because that's the truth, doesn't mean that, that, that artists should be getting paid when others aren't. We are all struggling and we need to be there. And so for me, I view it, the artist has a responsibility to step forth and create to inspire people. But at the same time, there's a conversation that can be perhaps a little challenging for artists, which is this notion that art might be non-essential or less important. 
I like to think of this perhaps in a different way, which is that if we are attending to important issues, uh, going to work, doing our shopping, paying the, the, the mortgage or the rent, we tend to be on our best behavior. We are polite when we are out in public. When we go home is when we lose our temper or maybe share some of our pain. And so if society says that artists aren't all that important at this moment, it's because they love artists. They know that art is important. It's just, it's a soft and sensitive area. So it's not a place to worry about in this moment. The other part is that we tend to think of art as something that is a reward. And so at a time when people are really struggling, they think we, we become self-critical. I don't deserve a reward right now. I can't take the time right now. Those are genuine feelings. And, you know, Nabila and I both come from a theater background. The audience is always right. Whether or not we like what they say, the audience is always right. It's up to the artist to find a new way to engage. And so I don't think that the money has to necessarily be a problem as long as artists can begin to say, wait a minute, are there other ways we can access funding other than these old models that we were told we had to follow? And of course, different countries have different approaches to this, um, but there's no reason why money has to be an issue. Uh, and artists are creative. They can, they can explore new areas if they're allowed to do so by whatever system they operate in. So I think, sorry, Nabila, can I just jump in? I think I want to pick up on what Patrick said. Um, he talked about how art is seen as a reward and hence it's low priority and I, I agree. Um, I also think one of the reasons why it's low priority is because art can be very uncomfortable. Um, it's not always entertainment, it's not always comforting. Uh, art asks very difficult questions, uh, sometimes uncomfortable questions, painful questions and sometimes you walk out of a show or walk out of a gallery with more questions and answers. Um, and that is the role of the arts. But in a time of pandemic, um, is that what people want? Uh, they, they, they want to forget. They want a cheap narcotic uh, to, to take them away for a while. Um, and maybe that's why uh, superhero shows are so popular nowadays. Uh, but do you think one of the reasons why people do not feel that art is right at the top of the list is because it's not always comforting. It's not always soothing. I don't think that's, that's a cheap narcotic. <laughs> um, sorry, Patrick, do you want to go first? No, you, you go first. <laughs> um, you're saying whether art asking uncomfortable questions is the reason why some people don't yeah. Unit. Yes. I think the root of your question is is are people comfortable with questions in general? Like you know, not just artists, but anyone asking them questions, right? So in terms of um like just how uh you know Singapore society is set up uh and how people tend to think about, you know, how do I put food on the table? Um I'm only gonna worry about myself and my family. Um and, and these are things that, that, you know, I grew up kind of like in, in thinking about these things as well. I mean, think about your, edu your own education. It's, it's about charting your own pathway and, and taking care of yourself first. Um, and when you think about people asking questions outside, it can trouble that narrative for you, right? Because the moment people start asking you questions and you're not ready for those questions, then it's easy to kind of like shut those down. Um, and I'm thinking about things like... Um, you know, con uh, discussions are had on the internet, on social media, and how so easily discussions unravel, right? Because people are not comfortable with hearing questions and answering questions uh, in a way that um, in a way that respects the question asker sometimes. Um, and and so for me, it's about like whether troubling questions in general are are um, are allowed, and and is there an appetite for that in society? And I think that in Singapore. Um, I feel like sadly the conversational kind of like skills and still uh, argumentative, argumentative skills, I guess, is um, still yet to be developed or it's just not a priority in how we've been brought up. Mm. Um, and so I don't think it's just about the artist per se, but the artist is, you know, that is viewed as a troublemaker in, in Singapore society, I feel. Yeah, I mean, I agree that uh, people are generally uncomfortable with uncomfortable questions, sure. 
Uh, but that's, that's true in general. My, my point was that people's needs and, and desires change from time to time and they vary. So when the economy is well, when things are doing fine, they've got uh, um, a good job, uh, their, their material needs are met. Um, yeah, sure, they can indulge in, in more difficult art, challenging art that asks the, the difficult identity questions, philosophical questions, political questions. But when you've just been retrenched or you've, been, you've, you've had a pay cut and you're working from home and you've got stress, your wife is screaming, your kids are running around, um, I think your appetite for, for difficult questions uh, uh, diminishes. Um, and, and maybe that's why um, it's not high on the priority of, of art consumers or, or consumers. Okay. It's just a general observation. I, I, no, no, I, lo I love this line of questioning. So um, if we were to accept that we are going through a digital transformation and that COVID has kind of exacerbated that, mm. what happens when you go through a transformation like that? Well, the last time we had a transformation like that, the theater was revolutionized. So at a moment of great transformation, you look to the past to see what was worth holding on to and you transform for the future. So Shakespeare's theaters, as the theaters all the, around England, were packed. The audiences were made up of people, some of whom lived on the streets. They wanted inspiration. So the age we're leaving, is the industrial age, which was in place for a long time, was stable for so long that much of art was about challenging those structures. Those structures have all been blown away. And the worries that we hear on social media and the bizarre uh, and poorly worded ramblings of our public commentariat demonstrate that it's time for art to do what it did in Shakespeare's time, which is to step forward and propose bold new structures, bold new ways of being together, positive things. Art is not, to me, about difficult questions at all. It's about beauty. It's about adventure. The, ar the artist is the one who's always out ahead. You know, science fiction leads scientific discovery. Art left untrammeled will always be out ahead of the population. So if the population is going through a, a, a struggle, as they are now, and you came to my show and I started yelling at you and, and causing a commotion, you should walk out of my show and demand your money back. We create for the audience and what it needs right now. But I would suggest that if the, you're, you're locked in your home and you're worried about your money and everyone is screaming, that's exactly when you need art. Because we're being reminded that if what you do is count on a job and money and stability, it can be taken away in the bat of an eye. There must be something bigger to life. And what that is, is what art is after. So the notion of challenging questions coming from art is a type of art. But art really is the, the, the function of taking in the experience of the world, which right now is, in a sense, breathing in pain and breathing out beauty, right? It's, it's, a, it's compassion. It's empathy. It's togetherness. It's, it's, a, it's a constant commitment to the creative forces of the universe. And so you're absolutely right. If art is only offering you... Um, more suffering in the midst of suffering, that's not art, it's torture. Um, and if it's cheap narcotics, that's not art, it's entertainment, right? And I think we do need entertainment. Um, it's good to have a break. If you've had a hard day, I don't necessarily want to watch the most challenging piece that I've seen, but we all need a reason to get up in the morning. We all need a reason to see past the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune in a particular moment. So it's time for artists to step forward and remind us about the importance of beauty. And again, to go back to the drama model, that we can collaborate across disparate backgrounds with disparate skills to put on a show that comes out on time and on budget every time. We've got some skills in that side of it as well, right? So, yeah. Ooh, can I just add, Terence? Yes. Yeah, um, I think I was trapped by the question about the questions, uh, the question about troubling questions, but. I feel like the value of like theater, maybe personally for me with theater mm. at this time is offering people a speculative journey. Um, so, so it's not about kind of like, like narcotics, like what Patrick was saying, it kind of like traps you in, in the kind of um, like one state. 
but I like the idea of um, how theatre opens up possibilities. Um, and during a time when we're all like, you know, either socially distanced or forced to kind of be in one space, um, kind of like, you know, physically immobilized, I guess. Um, when you watch, a, when you encounter a piece of art, I like the idea of it letting you travel in the mind, right? And, and that can sound really kind of like abstract, but I think it offers a, a way to think about possibilities of the future, right? How the world can change, how your life can change, or how now it could be really difficult, but what, what, um, what possibilities might it bring in the future? And that is kind of, there's a kind of optimism to that, but I also think it's realism because like we can't just be thinking about, you know, yeah, we can think about struggles and all, but I feel that with art, you can kind of help people think about new ways to build the world. Um, and, and yeah, this is how I've been thinking about where mm. I can uh, offer value as a writer, I suppose, because I don't really want to I don't really want to write about like, things which people already are thinking about, but how can I offer new ways of thinking? So um, can I, yeah, can I prod you a bit on that? Uh, a personal question then, I mean, what do you think as an artist uh, is important to say right now uh, in, in these troubled times? Um, when you look at the, your computer screen, when you want to churn out a, a, a script, uh, what do you want to say? What do you think, what, what needs out there need to be addressed? <laughs> um, I think for, for me, not just in my art, but anything that I put out now nowadays, it's all about like how we can draw strength from each other or how we can, you know, um, f find, find a solution or, 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 or think, I don't know, for me, the message is more about thinking uh, of like a positive way of moving forward mm. um, and how I can offer yeah, like a more positive way of being, I suppose. Mm. Um, like what Patrick was saying, like you don't just want to be asking difficult questions for the sake of it. Um, and, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's hard for me to answer that now because I'm not currently writing anything. And maybe that, mm. that also says, speaks to some kind of struggle that I have. And I feel like some artists have about what, what is the value of my voice at this time? Because there's also a lot of noise as well. Um, I'm quite curious to see what Patrick, whether Patrick is working on anything that can answer to this. I'm, I'm working on a lot of pieces. I can't help myself with this. Let me, let's ask a different question. If we're coming out of a, a past form of art, and then we look at what is the future of art, this digital domain, look at ancient practices of drama. So the integrated performance practices from around the world. They're, they're practiced in different ways. Some might emphasize a little more dance or different types of dance, some a bit more music, but they're everywhere in the world, thousands of years of history. If you look into virtual reality, augmented reality and game domains, they're hiring people from those disciplines because it transfers. They're integrated forms working for the present day. And then ask, what is art? Basically, there are two forces. There's destruction and creation. Art is saying, I'm on the side of the creation. I'm going to look at whatever this is, and I'm going to create something beautiful. So we can sit in the street and say, we're all out of work and we're starving. And one person can punch somebody in the face, and I can sing you a song. I'm with the one who sings the songs. That's it. That's the alliance. And what I would suggest in my work, because I've been looking around for where is the great new work happening. I, I mentioned to the group at the beginning of this conversation that I've been dying to visit Singapore and I haven't been yet. And I happen to think that the way that Singapore looks to me and is designed and cared for to me is artistic. You care about the beauty of Singapore. You care about the beauty of your library. And then the fact that Team Lab, who, which I take to be one of the most revolutionary new groups that really is working in that new domain, didn't even know they were artists until Singapore brought them in and revealed that. What if the tradition of art in Singapore is the new art and that it's already there? And that this idea that art has to be something different, that you go somewhere to see, is only one way for art to be there. People around us all the time are being artful. One person can cook and it's just making food and another can cook and it, it is beautiful to watch because they're an artist. 
it goes back to the question that, that someone asked earlier about the plumber. The art is about care, about techne, about, about practice that is committed to beauty above all else. Let me do this with elegance. Let me do this with compassion. Let me do this with empathy. Let me do this in full connection with one another. And, and the artist prioritizes that. And I think that that's crucial. And, and to be able to ask these types of questions to say, well, we can't get together. We are together. We're together differently. How do we connect? We are connected. We're connected differently. We don't need to accept questions that have been inserted by other people because the artist has never accepted any commander other than a commitment to, I'm with the ones who sing the songs. I'm with the one who creates. I'm with the one who stands for the heart. I'm with the one who stands for compassion. I hope that we get paid. I hope that we can put on good shows, but I stand with those people regardless of the money or the structures, et cetera. Um, and where I think it's so important, and we've seen some of the questions and then some of this about the middle class is, art is for all of us. And if anyone begins to try and take art for any one group of people, they're violating the very premise of art. So art should be something that we love without having to be taught to love it. Art should be something that we love without having to be lectured about why you didn't understand it. And in that sense, art is all around us. And, and, and so I wonder if the questions that we're having now won't begin to free us up and we'll just forget about some of the past problems because there's already all kinds of new art that's happening that's coming straight out of this world. And the one aspect of it that I hope will break through is for those who've given their lives to the art and are trapped in structures that, that maybe have made them think, I, mean, I don't belong over here in the digital, et cetera. Digital is nothing other than a connective tissue. You need great pianists and great dancers and great writers, and you always will. The digital component is just a different way for us to collaborate. Nabila, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> um, I, I, I feel like, uh, I feel like there are artists who do want to ask the troubling questions still, you know what I mean? And, and I think during this time is when people are starting to question, you know, the effects of just the art industry being kind of like really part of like a capitalistic structure and the ideas of how like we've always been uh, fixated on, you know, producing more and more work um, and, and not quite reflecting on, you know, maybe even past work. We very rarely restage, you know, work or revisit past work in Singapore. Um, and, and there's this idea of like this time being a great pause as well, right? Where we can kind of uh, reflect and all these things, which is really nice. But I also think it's, uh, it's a time when you can start to question things which we haven't questioned in a while. You know, why have we always been doing it this way? Can we think of new ways to do things? Um, and something that this year has been coming out, um, at least for me and some of the practitioners that I work with, is the idea of how can we practice in a more compassionate way with each other? Um, you know, how have rehearsal practices or production practices maybe um, at, some, at some level kind of like exploited our labor? Um, and I'm not even talking about the industry exploiting, but sometimes we exploit ourselves, right? We do things without, um, sometimes like we don't mind doing things out of goodwill, for example. And, and during this time, it's also a time to question whether or not we've been doing that at the expense of, you know, ourselves or our care or our labor to each other. Um, is also something that has come out during this time. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Great. Okay, so I've been told that it's time for uh, our second poll. Uh, so Patrick, do you, before that, do you want to add anything to what Nabila said or shall we just proceed? I, well, I, I love what she said. Um, I, I, so I think that the pause can allow us to say, why would we have ever thought that one has to be a plumber or an artist? Right, like these these kinds of stereotypes of like this is what the artist is like, and this is what that person is like, and this is what that it separates us all out. So, it's it's a bit bizarre even that we would say you know well what about the artist or what about the craftsperson what about what about all of us? What about all of us? Don't we all care about the suffering that is going on right now? Don't we all wish we could be together? Don't we all care about ideas and beauty? Don't we all care about the same things? And 
maybe this pause will let us soften some of those so-called divisions that we feel. Because at the end of the day, if I'm creating art, I'm creating it for you, for, because I want to connect. It's, you don't go into it to, to, to make big money. You would go into selling those cheap narcotics you mentioned. You know, it's, it's you go into it because you care, mm -hmm. right? The same reason people go and get jobs to pay the bills, right? It's, so I hope that we can reconnect to that. And I love the way that Nabila has pointed that out, that compassion piece, which is that, you know, theater when it works and live being together is because we feel each other. We are empathetic creatures. And so if we can lean into that empathy and remember that we actually are connected, right? Before you put satellites in the sky, we were on a ball flying through space. We are connected. And maybe if we remind ourselves to feel a little more from the heart and not worry so much about the head, uh, that we might be further ahead when we move into the next phase of whatever the world is. Mm. Okay, so let's go on to our second poll. Uh, can we bring it up, please? Okay, which statement most accurately reflects your views on addressing the challenges that COVID-19 poses to the arts community? Number one, artists need to do more. Uh, government needs to do more. Audiences need to do more. The private sector needs to do more as sponsors. So all those listening in, please don't hesitate to, to chime in and uh, check the the sentence that, that most uh, um, resonates with you. Okay. So Patrick. Yep, this is an easy one for me. Government artists, or the artists? Artists need to do more. It has Why? to be. It, Why? Because in, in, in times of trouble, the artist has to step forward. Look, if there's something that is common to artists, it, that they're used to discomfort. Um, and so when you get into places where the world is struggling in that, Artists are comfortable in those spaces, and the artist is the one that needs to get out there and inspire. So this is, to me, uh, not a time to be asking about more money or government structures or any of these types of things. I, I get that artists are struggling, but that's the nature of being an artist. You have to jump out and write that poem that's going to that's gonna inspire. I'll share a brief story. There's a, 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 a national radio service here in the country, and it would play little bits of classical music at the end of the day. And there was a phone-in show, and a woman called in to thank the host of the show uh, for playing this symphony that had, been, that had been performed in a city here. And she talked about the fact that her husband was on his deathbed. Um, he was going to be passing away in the next number of weeks. And in the evening, they would give him enough medicine that he could get a bit of sleep. And that was her only break. And listening to that music is what got her through that time. The world is in pain, and so the artist has no choice but to step forward and to give voice to that pain and to sing out to that pain and to transform that pain and remind people of the creative aspect, right? The, the good in the world, love, compassion. So the artist has to do much, much, much more. And all of those other organizations, um, hopefully, they decide to jump in and support it, but the artist has a responsibility to the audience, to their fellow human beings, to connect. So I would say the artist has to do more. What would you say to the artist who says, um, well, I can't really create until I have the proper infrastructure around me, uh, support, uh, sponsorships, um, some grants, for example, a seed grant to begin a project. What do you say to artists like that? <laughs> Well, I would be compassionate because we are in a difficult time, but I would remind them of John Lennon saying that uh, he said, I'm an artist, give me a tuba, I'll get something out of it. Um, governments should give money to the arts because it's in the best interest of society, but artists do not need governments. Um, artists don't need anything, they're artists. If you want to have art in your society, you need to get funding into the hands of artists and those who will put on art because if you don't, you have a stunted society that will have no inspiration whatsoever in it. But an artist that says, I can't do anything unless you pay me is not an artist. They're someone who wants to live off government money and make art. So it's a, it's a really difficult thing to say because I don't want anyone to suffer, believe me. And, mm. and if you work as an artist in my country, as I have, you live below the poverty line most of your life. 
But the fact that like the evidence is clear, great art has nothing to do with money. And in fact, once you get a lot of money, generally your art sucks. So the, the artist who says I can't do anything because I don't have sufficient money. Look, it might be that you're hungry and, and you're, and you're, you maybe you've got a tooth that needs to be, I mean, there can be real crises, but artists can't help but create. Mm. So nothing mm. else matters. And so if mm. they say, oh, I can't do it unless somebody pays me. Sorry, uh, you're not an artist. You're something else, but you're not an artist. Mm. Mm. Can we put up the poll again? I see the findings. Findings are up. Yeah. So unfortunately, many do not agree with you, Patrick. Um, most of them say, 41% um, say audiences need to do more. So we need to be consuming more art for uh in order to, to address well, I, 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 I would point out that i'm an artist and they are the audience so we both have come out in favor of we should do more so i think that everybody mm. is is showing initiative and saying mm. that we should get in there and do more it's beautiful to say that audiences should do more because that's a lovely way to say uh that people should support artists and so that answer uh warms my heart uh, i yeah, yeah. We're talking yeah. before about maybe Art not being essential, that's a beautiful thing for people to have said. So whoever voted for that, good for you. You're I'm very person. encouraged by, by the findings, actually, because um, the responsibility of owners is, is on the arts consumer to go out there and find art to consume. And I think that's very encouraging uh, as, as for, for artists to see. Uh, Nabila, your thoughts? This is quite a funny poll. <laughs> um, because if I think about it, Audiences don't need to do anything to address the challenge of the arts community. But they need to consume the arts. There needs to be a there needs to be a demand for the arts, right? Yeah, but but the demand is not generating. It's in the, the audience isn't the one that creates the demand, right? The artist still has to create like something to be demanded. So I I find it quite 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 an interesting poll. I mean, I feel like if I had to choose, I would choose both. I mean, it's cheating, of course, but I'll choose both the artists and the government. Um, but for artists to do more, I also think it's about ability and willingness uh, to do more. Um, so, you know, you can have, you can, you can feel like you want to do more um, and that's willingness, right? But is there an ability to do more? That's a diff different question because if you are busy, you know, if you're busy being a delivery uh, rider, for example, then you don't, you know, you don't necessarily want to go into uh, doing more. Doesn't sound like a thing you want to be doing, right, for the arts, because you, you feel kind of like sidelined by that, for example. Um, I think the government can do more, but I'm not sure whether it's funding is what I'm trying, I'm kind of like currently struggling with, because the Singapore government at least has a lot of grants out uh, during, during COVID at least, there were multiple grants that, you know, uh, freelancers could access, for example. Um, and I think like even if you are not a freelancer, if, if you're an arts company, you could use your existing grants that you receive for the year, even if you didn't, you know, produce a new work, you could use it to pay your, you know, employees, for example. Um, and already we're seeing like that, that um, the kind of like existing grants are being redesigned so that people can uh, uh, access kind of like a higher proportion of government funding um, and, and they're supporting more digital work, which is great. So we are already seeing the transformation that Patrick was say, say uh, mentioning earlier, right? Like um, a transformation of the arts to include digital more comfortably, I suppose, within mm. an artist's um, practice. But I'm not sure if funding is all it is when it comes to the government. I see someone commenting about how the South Korean government support is kind of like um, a kind of a larger support, right? Lifting censorship, increased branding and infrastructure. Um, I think like that the government is thinking about ways to support the industry a bit more. But the underlying thing I think is about like the value of the arts, like kind of going back to what we spoke about earlier, like how is arts valued in, in society and how do we see that from the actions of the state or from the instruments of the state? Um, and, and whether we see that, um, you know, in schools, for example, whether we see it in, uh, in terms of like um, capacity to question what I was like mentioning earlier, um, yeah, so I, I do feel like the government has something has to do something, but I'm not sure it's, if it's about um, handouts per se. I don't I don't think it's about handouts. I think it's more like a kind of a larger question about the value of arts in society. Yeah. Well, now, can I take advantage of the fact that I have a local playwright in front of me and just ask, I mean, 
What do you think of the Singapore artists? I mean, do you think the Singapore artists generally waits for hand, handouts? Um, are local artists resilient enough to, as Patrick said, just go out there and create art and understand that you have to suffer from time to time? Or do you think that because there is money... Uh, Wait, I want to qualify this because there's somebody else that's asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, know, I know. I saw that question as well. I'll, I'll okay, give you a chance. Folks, I'll give you a chance. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I did not say that you have to suffer. I said you choose the way you want to work. One okay. of the things that happens structurally is that the artist is told, oh, you have to go over here and do grants. So in Canada, if you're successful and you work as an artist, right, and so you're famous in our country, you will live around the poverty line for your life. And if you go out and get extra money from additional, you're not allowed to put that into your company. I'm not saying that you have to suffer okay. for art. What I'm saying is you have to prioritize art. That can mean that you can become a, you know, a poet laureate like Wallace Stevens and be the vice president of an insurance company. It can mean that you're a plumber. What it means is that as an artist, you're the one making the shot, the calling the shots. If the government tells you, hey, we'll let you make art, but you need to honor these three policies. Anything that tells the artist what they have to do diminishes the quality of the art. It's just because like you don't tell a carpenter, make sure that your carpentry honors these three. It's like be a carpenter be an artist, be a whatever. But I appreciate those questions because I don't want you to be thinking that I've given up that sort of that old fashioned. No, it's yet another one of those stereotypes, right? That like, oh, we suffer. No, we don't. The condition of being an artist is pain comes in, beauty comes out. That's a very healthy practice. Uh, okay. it's, it's the structures that can get in the way. Mm -hmm. So the notion of handouts and stuff, that's the problem is it's not about the money. It's about the structures that get in the way. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the clarification, Patrick. So, can I just get back to Nambila and, and talk about Singapore artists? Um, do you think um, um, there is resilience within the arts community? Oh yes, but I think you changed your question there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I feel like I don't think artists are waiting for handouts at all. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's not about yeah. I don't think it's about that. I think it's about. Um, I think it's more about the health of the industry, right? When the industry was very healthy, people could apply for grants and, and um, you know, get the grant and then do the work. Um, and Wait, I forgot what was your question earlier, but I think it's, it's more about like, um, fund, I feel like funding structures when, they're, when they work well are great. But then now when you realize that the funding doesn't actually resolve a kind of like more fundamental question about value of the arts and how society values the arts, that's where I feel the government can do more. Mm. So, so just to, to throw this in, um, in April 2020, uh, the government in the, uh, one of its budgets introduced the Arts and Culture Resilience Package and it was worth $55 million. And uh, this package would provide a job and training for artists, as well as uh, digital presentation grants. Uh, and it's funded uh, to date about 320 projects. So 55 million, I mean, not, not fantastic, but, but not, not a small sum either. Um, so I think there is money out there. So I guess my, my, my question then is, is the government is responding. Does the arts community in Singapore uh, feel that this is enough? Um, oh, okay, we can, we can go on and, and, and make art now. Or does the arts community still uh, require more help from the government? I think that the money does a lot in terms of like encouraging people to create work, mm. right? But is creating work the only thing that we need to be doing now is... Mm. is maybe where I'm more coming from. Because I think that this year, it wasn't just about losing work, it was also like losing spaces, right? So I think, um, um, like, you know, the necessary stage and, you know, ITI, which is an art school here, um, and the substation, right? So there's this question of like, uh, in Singapore, there's a lot of spaces, art spaces that are being lost as well. And, and, and I feel like, so the grants is great, but somehow there are a lot of other things that are happening in the industry. And as an artist, you see it all as a whole, right? To see whether or not there's, uh, whether or not um, the value of the arts is being, like, how is it being communicated uh, on a larger scale? Um, I think that's more of like where I feel, um, yeah, we can kind of, kind of like plug the gaps in that. Um, I don't know whether we're going to do it, do it that year, 
I don't think we've only been losing spaces this year. We've always been losing just because in Singapore of how like land use is 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 done and negotiated. Um, but losses are felt a bit more significantly, I feel, during this time. Mm. What's the situation in Canada, Patrick? Um, do you see the artists as being um, uh, resilient? And what's the arts funding uh, like in, in Canada? Um, well, so it's, there are two aspects to this. So there are, there are packages that are there, but we are seeing um, serious capacity loss in the, the types of people that I mentioned before. Um, and this is a challenge that I think comes out of the older model of the arts, which the structure is the issue that I have, the people are all phenomenal. And this is a kind of a, uh, an obsession with, you know, the lead actor or the author of the book. And those of us working in the domain know that it takes a village to put on one show or to create a great book. Uh, you know, think about being at the National Library. An author of a book, there was a tradition that you know that a book has my name on it there's an archivist behind that. There are research librarians, special collections people, people that I've worked with in the editing and the copywriting and the research space. It's a group of people. These are capacity pieces that society's put together to stand for ideas. And so those aspects we're starting to see challenges on. We are, however, very fortunate in that our government addressed how to transition into the digital age for our arts. And I, I want to be really clear about this. It just means we live in the digital age. It does not mean if you're a dancer that you should give up dancing to go and learn how to program. We need, we need you to keep doing what you're doing, but to understand that the new common language is a digital one. And it occurs to me as I, you know, we proceed with this conversation that perhaps this pause that we have is going to allow us the time to take advantage of to seeing what can this technology do? Because the people in our industry work long, long, long hours with very little money, which means they don't have a lot of time to stop and try and consider all of these new changes. Now, we're all having to look at it. And so everyone will maybe get a chance to say, here are some of the things from the digital we want to keep. Here are, uh, and I've thought about the way we work together. Here's how we can use space better. Here's how we can collaborate better. Um, here's how maybe we can work with the government better because I think that wh however we work, whether it's with private industry, with one another, with governments, it's also about having the conversation with the government, right? If you want to do art, how can we work together? And so we might begin to say, look, how do we make sure that we can work in the ways that we need to and we make good use of funds? I mean, the big one for me with government funding is that if you look just at drama, which I take to be the integration of dance, music, and action, right? It has 2,500 years of formal study and more than that before that in terms of performance. And in the world, if I make a show, I get it ready, I take it through Canada and the US or the UK, I take it to Japan, China, Singapore, it goes around the world. And everywhere I perform, there are workshops with the local artists and we trade, right? What are you doing here? And what have you been working on? Or what are your practices? And I'd like to see us explore how we'll get back to that. And if we can't tour anytime soon, what can collaboration look like with these technologies as we're trying to solve these problems together? Because I have a feeling that, you know, Nabila's next play is going to be her best play. And it's going to be about something that will help us process what these feelings of this time are. And it will be from this new domain. And then we'll begin to talk about, and these were the great new renaissance, right? The new digital age artworks. And we'll look back at the, the pieces that we now are feeling nostalgic for as the middle ages, as the, those uh, that came before. Um, so there are, there are a lot of changes going on and I really wanna be careful that I don't minimize the suffering. We are suffering profoundly and artists, as I say, are sensitive people, um, but uh, we've committed our lives to art. So it's not like we're suffering and all we do is, you know, make weapons to harm people. Uh, we're, living, we're living lives for the right reasons. And so I, I, I am optimistic for uh, our ability to address this. But I, it sounds like we are in very much the same condition as you. The government is trying to do its best. The artists are arguing for their community. There's, there's great um, uh, activity in the community as people are trying to take care of one another. But we, like I think every sector, are struggling and we are 
heartbroken over the suffering that's going on all around us. So I'm conscious of time. I think we have about three, three to four minutes left before the end of this conversation. Um, just, just a final concluding question. Um, so Patrick, you, you mentioned just now that um, the digital is just connective tissue. Uh, it's just a channel to, to convey your art form to, to another place, a portal if you like. Um, so there is a mediating uh, uh, factor uh, on, on your art now and, and it impacts the way people consume uh, the art. Um, so do you think artists would have to create with this in mind or do they continue just creating art the way they've always created and allow the digital medium to take the piece to wherever it may go or, or allow the audiences to interpret it in, in any fashion it, it, uh, they, they wish to. Um, and that's, that's to Nabila as well, who, who, who is a playwright. Yeah, so excellent question. Um, and thank you so much for all of the, the questions you've been asking because they're tremendous. The, uh, we are all digital citizens. This is the digital age. And so all art that I make is digital. All art that any artist makes is digital. But that's because digital is primary literacy of our society. As a digital artist, I can decide that this show has to be one person standing on a stage with one bare bulb above my head. I choose the way to create and live in the world. But we live in a world that is defined by digital communication. So it's a primary literacy in the same way the book was primary literacy in the industrial age. And so we're in that big moment of transition. And as that moment of transition occurs, Political systems seem not to be working. Lines of communication seem not to be working. Old forms of language aren't working. We're hearing people saying, oh, we keep trying the same thing, but it's not where it's because we've moved into a new domain. And so it's still the same thing, though, to me. The original question about the artist was, do they have techne, right? The, the original debate in the old uh, uh, Greek uh, conditions, techne, which becomes technology, technologos, when we get the printing press, then technique, technical, now information technology, it's how we do, what we do, when we do, what we do. And the technology of the words that Nabila speaks or writes are incredibly important. And the technology of hand gestures, the, the technology of voice, of speech, of, it's just things we can choose. Still the audience, still connection, still us, still here, just a new set of tools that we can choose. The artist has an idea, an impulse, or a desire to create, and then selects how to do that. Um, and so everything we do is digital, and I think that this pause is allowing everyone to understand that. Um, and I think that the, the power of digital is that it's much more effective at allowing us to collaborate more broadly and as we begin to understand how to use those tools to connect more broadly and to understand the impacts of what it means to be connected at scale and how that can change what happens with language and meaning um, will begin to begin to realize that I think that this technology may be the most nimble and most organic thus far. It's just that we need our artists to be leading it and not people using design techniques to use this technology to manipulate people. Nebula. Mm. I've I've heard of uh, I've heard of some people who um, who've said like oh this is all this is not real you know like this virtual thing is not real like what's happening now is just temporary and and I can I can see where they're coming from and it's quite comforting sometimes to think about it in that way when you feel like you know you've been violently um, um, kind of like taken out of your usual kind of um, ways that you're working um, but I feel like. I be, I've started to think about it in a different way where artifice isn't a bad thing and in theatre at least we've been using artifice to our strength right like so a, a piece of prop uh, like a cloth can be can become anything you want it to be um, and we've accepted that artifice as something magical right uh, in theatre at least um, so why not look at the virtual world in a similar way how can we think about it in a more magical way rather than rather than kind of look at it in a oh hardware ones and zeros kinds of kind of thing um, and the other thing is like just to share so I wrote a digital play like a really short 
um, work. I mean, it wasn't digital. It was meant to be live. And I, I created a video version of it. Um, and there was one point where the actors were all in their own like houses, right? On Zoom. And there was one point where they were trying to pass like a bottle. So like I would pass a bottle to you, right, right, right Terrence? But the bottle you receive would be slightly different from the one that I pass, like a different color, maybe right, red. And then you pass it to Patrick and Patrick gets a different bottle. And it's all like really weird. And there was no attempt to make them the same at all. Um, but just that bit of artifice like created a, um, my cousin was watching it and she was like, oh wow, like it made me really realize that, it, you know, how difficult it is to create work during this time. But also it made me really um, like proud to see artists still doing work and trying to make the best out of the situation, but not just making the best, but really kind of like triumphing over the, like, you know, what we're being asked to do right now. And I feel like just that difference in like that bottle um, to me, it kind of like is the beauty of the limitations that we're working with now. And if we see it as a strength, then um, we can start to just um, think about things in a new and positive way, I suppose. Making use of the new and innovating with it and turning it to, to your advantage, I guess. And, 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 and looking at it as a puzzle, trying to figure it out and creating new things as you, as you move along, I think. In order to kind of sum up and to allow our speakers to have uh, make some concluding remarks. Uh, what I'm supposed to do now is to pose a general question. And uh, I invite uh, Patrick and Nabila to answer it in your, in your own way. Uh, feel free to interpret the question uh, as, as you wish, because I think we've answered bits and pieces of, of the question already. And, and the question is, how can the public support the arts sector during this trying period? Uh, a broad question uh, with enough room for you to, to summarize your thoughts, if you will. Uh, perhaps in reversal, can I just ask Nabila to, to, to uh, start off and then we'll end with Patrick. Hmm. Um, oh my God, I hate asking people to do things during this time. <laughs> um, I don't know, I feel like even reading books from the library to me gives me hope as an artist right um to see where the where the space for the arts can be in your life and maybe to be a bit more conscious perhaps of um of the work that an artist has put in i suppose whether it's a book that you're reading or you know like that good night story that Patrick was saying that a parent is reading to their kids um whether it's a netflix show um just to think about who has you know who, who has been involved in the creation of that. I think it's also in line with like just being a bit more conscious of what we consume in general, right? Like just thinking about more environmental kind of ways to think about things. Um, who's, who's, who's involved in the creation of a, of a book, right? Um, who, who was involved in um, the designing of a, a, a chart, right? Um, and, and I was just thinking about that, um, that essential, non-essential survey um, that, that we had in, here in Singapore where, you know, um, just thinking about the value that um, people perceive artists to have in society. Um, if people can start to just have a thought about wh where they, um, what, like, what value they think artists give, then I think that's enough. I really don't want to ask a lot from the public, to be honest, during this time, everyone's trying their best. Um, but yeah, just to like live life, I suppose and think and consume art while doing it. Yes, Patrick. if you can. Patrick. That's, that's, uh, I now realize how fortunate I was to go before Nabila when these questions were asked, because that's a tremendous answer. Uh, so I would, um, I would say that in a sense, we have an example in the chat, uh, which is that we've got a bunch of people that are giving feedback, asking tough questions, asking encouraging questions, uh, making suggestions, the artist really, the audience is like, there's nothing more beautiful than for me to make something and you say, I, I'd like it more if it was rounder. Like, like I want feedback to improve my work. That's, that's how the artist works. And so as long as the audience is willing to be honest with the artist, that's the greatest thing we can ever ask for. You know, it's our job to come and, and encourage you to take a look at the art. It's our job to keep you uh, interested. It's our job to 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 earn your attention but on the other side of this and in honor of the way that this set of conversations has been set up i would suggest 
that when we're in a time of major transformation, we are currently used to the rhetoric of tear things away, break apart structures, do all this kind of stuff. And we might want to be aware that we can lose some of the most important things in our society because we've come to take them for granted because they've been around for such a long time. And the areas that I worry about most are the core of the library and the core of the support structures for the arts. So not the person like me, whose name is maybe on something or comes up on the stage. It's all of the people that make art possible. And it's all of the people inside of the real engine of ideas of the universities and the libraries. And those people to me are those archivists, special collections librarians, editors, publishers, scholarly presses. And then the people inside of the arts that are the technicians, the highly skilled people that bring people in through a mentorship practice. Um, like, believe me, there are so many times when I'll go and do something and it seems like, wow, he's done a terrific job. And you have no idea how many people are making me not look like a fool. <laughs> um, and so I would say that there are a lot of unsung heroes out there and they are much more important than I am. And um, we might want to bring some attention to them. Uh, because if you think of any time you've heard an artist accept an award or whatever, unless they're an egomaniac, they will always say, let me read you this long list of people that made this possible. Uh, and so I would say that uh, the public, for their own sake, should ask themselves, what do we want out of the ideas of our society? How much does our society um, own its own ideas and want its ideas taken care of? because the custodian of ideas is answerable to all of us. They're your ideas. It is your culture, uh, not any one artist's. Uh, so I would suggest some attention mm. to that. Yeah. Mm. Just quickly add. Sure. It's, it's also about um, seeking out narratives that are different from ours. Um, maybe during this time, thinking about how do other people, how are other people thinking about things? How can I um, support an artist that I don't usually support um, who may not be in Singapore, right? It could be like from the other side of the world that you don't usually uh, think about. Um, because I feel like it's also about breaking out of echo chambers and how we've always been, um, you know, doing things. Um, I think like this time would be a great time to seek out a story from, let's say, another part of, you don't even have to look far, like another part of Southeast Asia, right? An artist in Southeast Asia who you may not have um, supported or heard of. And now is the time when everyone's putting stuff online. Um, and then that's when you can go and seek out those narratives um, as well. So if I can sum up, you, you want people to live life, consume art, as well as to come out of their comfort zones and seek new narratives. And for Patrick, it's about... Um, not taking arts, arts practitioners and arts institutions and cultural centers for granted because these are the, the key notes for, for art uh, production. So I, just, I, I really think what I heard from Nabila there was that she would like to get a lot of funding to write a <laughs> play about me. I'm all the way on the other side of the world and it's a new, be a new play starring me written by Nabila, I think that that's a terrific idea and I completely support what she has just uh, requested there and would suggest that everyone immediately begin transferring money to her Swiss bank account. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> with, with me as producer as well. Exactly, exactly. Well, we've got to keep the band together. Yeah, all right. Thank you very much, both of you. It's been a real pleasure to chat with you. I've learned so much. Um, and I, I really appreciate uh, NLB's effort in bringing up this uh, four conversation series. Uh, great thanks to the team behind uh, this. As, as Patrick said, uh, these kind of things do not happen on their own, uh, but only through the effort of many people behind the scenes or behind the screen uh, in this case. So thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Melvin. Thank you very much, uh, Terence. And ladies and gentlemen, just give the, your biggest virtual applause for all our guest speakers, as well as Terence, for moderating this session as well. Yes, definitely. 
Um, and, you know, even for us at the National Library of Singapore, and as part of today's conversation, you know, it may get you all thinking, it may have spurred up a lot of thought-provoking, you know, knowledge-seeking uh, yeah. abilities in you. Uh, we especially put together an online resource guide, you know, for free for everyone, you know, to digest the information and to build up your knowledge base even more. You can access it through this uh, QR code, as you can see on the screen uh, right over here. And we'll be posting the link as well into the chat. And just feel free to head on down to the link uh, and just refer to the resource guide. It's completely free. And, you know, you never know. You may just, you know, find something even better to build up your current knowledge on the discussion topic at hand. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as well as to our fellow speakers, you know, I would like to thank you for your participation. And we look forward to seeing you. Uh, we do have another, uh, the last conversation uh, program uh, this evening, Singapore time, 6 p.m. Uh, the conversation is on the development of urban design. Thank you very much for tuning in once again, ladies and gentlemen, to wherever you're tuning from in this world. Have a great day ahead.